Good afternoon, if you could please take your seats. I am Dr. Sean Byrne, Director of the Arthur V. Morrow Center for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College here at the University of Manitoba. I wish to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you today to the 10th Sol Caney Lecture in Peace and Justice featuring human rights activist Ananra Karala. The lecture is presented by the Morrow Center. The Morrow Center is dedicated to research, education, and practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the areas of conflict analysis and resolution, human rights, peace, and social justice. The Morrow Center is home to the university's PhD program in peace and conflict studies offered through the Faculty of Graduate Studies. The PhD program is the first doctoral program of its kind in Canada and one of only a few in the world. The program has grown to four faculty members. In addition to myself, Dr. Maureen Flaherty, Dr. Jessica Senehy, and Dr. Hamdessa Tuso. In addition, more than 24 adjunct faculty serve on student doctoral and master's committees in peace and conflict studies from the University of Manitoba across faculties, as well as from Menno Simons College, the University of Winnipeg, and Canadian Mennonite University. 34 students from 18 different countries are enrolled in the PhD program, many of whom hold college, university, national, and international scholarships. There are now 11 alumni of the program who hold academic positions locally and around the world. A joint master's program with the University of Winnipeg admitted its first students in fall 2010. There are now 29 students in the program, and in two weeks' time, the first four students will graduate from the MA program. Matt Fast, Lisa McLean, Hayato Nakayama, and Laura Normand. PAC's graduate students have come from around the corner and around the world in a quest to create human rights, social justice, and peace in our world. This lecture series was established by the Morrow Center to honor Mr. Sol Caney, an officer of the Order of Canada who was a prominent citizen in our community. His biography is in the lecture program. It was a vision of Dr. Arthur Morrow and of the Morrow Center's founding board of directors to hear from global leaders of different faiths and backgrounds who are working for a world characterized by justice and sustainable peace. The previous Sol Kani speakers are Prince El Hassan Ben Talal of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy, Rabbi Michael Melchior, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, PhD, Distinguished Professor and Hudna Shawnee Chief Oren Lyons, the Honorable Flora MacDonald, Dr. Isaldin Abuelesh, Dr. Pumlo Gobodo Medicazela, and Dr. Martin Manzer. This year we are privileged to be able to hear from Ms. Anura Korala. Many thanks to James Richardson and Sons Limited and the Richardson Foundation for sponsorship of the Sel Caney Lecture Series. A program is provided with the format of today's lecture. I would now like to call upon Ms. Joy Smith, who will bring greetings as the MP for Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you very much, and uh, I changed several things around today um, because they asked me to come uh, to be with uh, Anorda uh, Kerala, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I know what you do. I've, been know I've known about it for many years, and I want to welcome Nikki Ashton. I'm so glad you're here, too, as well, Nikki, and all of you that are here. Because as you know, in this country, we have human trafficking. Human trafficking is worldwide. And what brought me to uh, deal with the human trafficking issue in Canada was my son, who's now with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. 
But was he, what his job was when he belonged to the Integrated Child Exploitation Unit, which was the ICE unit, was to track predators of children over the internet. Unfortunately, he paid a big price. I could see very a uh, huge change in my son. He would disappear for long periods of time, rescuing kids, doing things that ICE unit police officers do. So being a mom, the first thing I was concerned about, what, what, what was happening to my son? And so I went around, I found out more than I wanted to know. And that led me to working with uh, the exploited children and with uh, victims of human trafficking for almost 14 years now. It's what drove me to go to Parliament Hill. And I have to say that in this country now, uh, I passed two laws. One was Bill 268, that was mandatory minimums for traffickers of children 18 years and under. My second law was Bill C310, and that reaches the long arm of the Canadian law into other countries when Canadian citizens or permanent residents traffic victims. We can bring them back to Canada because often the predators go there into countries that don't have strong judicial systems, that don't have strong police forces. So we have those two tools. In addition to that, I wrote, the pro I wrote the prototype to the National Action Plan. It was called Connecting the Dots, and now we have a Canadian National Action Plan. So for me to be here with you, Anada, and to be uh, listening to all the wonderful work that you have done, it takes one or two or three or four or five people to have a vision to stop the buying and selling of children. If you can imagine in my heart how I felt absolute disbelief and dismay when I started to work with the young girls, and some boys too, but mainly young girls who had been bought and sold, girls who had been tattooed here in this country. And I'll just tell you very briefly about Mia. Mia was trafficked from the US into Canada. She serviced men for seven years. She thought she was gonna die. She decided the only way she could escape, because traffickers in Canada force their victims to service men at night, and then what they do during the day is they shoplift. So she went to the Shoppers Drug Mart in Montreal, and she uh, put a whole bunch of stuff in her, in her jacket. She knew security would catch her. Not only that, she kicked the security guard really hard, so she knew she'd be arrested. And she was so buzzed out by drugs because what they do, predators come on as their friends or their boyfriends and then they shoot them up with drugs, sell them, rape them, and put them on, the, on I would say, the streets. But it's not the streets really anymore. It's in the hotels. With Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of the things, the predators do business a little differently now. I hid Mia for the better part of a year. She testified in Montreal 54 hours of testimony. At the end of the time of the brutalization, she serviced 40 men, up to 40 men a night. At the end of her testimony, the judge threw out a mistrial. He said it was a mistrial because a detective forgot to hand in a little booklet. Well, I kind of wonder about that judge. But having said that, she's going back on that trial again um, sometime in the next month, I believe it starts again. So we hit her again. And this little girl, I can tell you, I've never seen so much courage. Some of these young girls who go through so much, the courage that they have. I would dare say I was in that courtroom with her in Montreal, and I can tell you the thugs came in and they tried to intimidate her. A victim makes between 260000 and 280000 a year from these innocent victims. That's here in the true north, strong and free in Canada. So you sitting here today are listening to this wonderful woman who is a hero in my eyes, and I'm honored to be on the same podium with you. And you know what? You should be congratulated, each and every one of you sitting here today, because what this is about is caring about the people who have no voice, as it is here in Canada. And I have to say to you that there's many things now that we're starting to do in Canada that are very, very good. I talked about my two bills, but there's many other things. I won't take up the time today. 
Uh, I know I've been given about 10 minutes, and I think I've used up about eight of them. But I could tell you a million stories, a million stories. But I think I'll tell you a bit of a funny one, because it's a pretty heavy topic you're listening to today. And it's about the realities of the world when my husband came to me and said, you know what, our bank account's been going down and down and down, because what I was doing is, you know, moving kids across across the country, hiding them from organized crime and others who wanted to go after them, because these, these traffickers never give up, never give up. And I have to tell you, if you made that kind of money tax-free, I guess that's how they look at it, right? Unfortunately, it destroys lives, and they always prey on the young. So my husband said, you know what, we can't use any more money on this. So I started a charity, the Joy Smith Foundation. And I'm happy to say that we saved a safe house in Edmonton just three weeks ago from closing. And it was to end my, my greetings to you. I have to say that the greatest thing was th three months ago, my son and I went and visited that safe, safe house. It's a secret safe house. It's not an, a, a house for abused women. It's, it's a house, a safe house. They have to keep people from grabbing these victims and putting them to work again. And I have to say, this one young girl, she was only 17, and she had a little baby boy. He was in a stroller. She had been accosted when she was 13 years of, of age. She had serviced many men. And this little baby boy was in a stroller, and he reached up, and he grabbed my son's hand, and he kept hanging on and hanging on. And finally, Edward said, buddy, you got to let go. i got to catch a plane. And you know, this dear little boy, this dear little boy, and this girl did not know who the father was. She just got pregnant. But she loved that little boy so very much. And you know what? A lot of these victims are the heroes in our country, in other countries as well, because they're resilient. When people like Anarda go and rescue them, they give them a chance to live a chance to develop their potential, and a chance to regain their lives. So, Madam, it is such an honor for me to be here with you today. I, I changed heaven and earth to be here to listen to you. You are my hero. You are many Canadian, as many Canadians and others sitting in this room. You are our hero because of the love you have in your heart for these innocent victims. So I say to you, this is indeed an honor and a pleasure, and I thank you all for sitting in your seats today, coming here, and listening to the hard stuff, because it is hard. But you know what? The light at the end of the tunnel is lives can be saved, lives can be redeemed and helped, and some of these girls are awesome, the most courageous heroes you've ever seen because they're survivors. So on behalf of myself and behalf, on behalf of the Government of Canada, and I'm sure Nikki Ashton too, who's part of our family, I just want to thank you for, for all that you're doing for these victims of human trafficking here in Canada and abroad. It's a global pro problem, and we have to work together to stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I would now like to call upon Ms. Diane Crothers, MLA for St. James, who will bring greetings on behalf of the Honorable Jennifer Howard, Minister for the Status of Women in the Province. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. I'm very pleased to join you for the 10th annual Soul Kinney Lecture on Peace and Justice and to bring you greetings on behalf of the Honourable Jennifer Howard, Minister responsible for the status of women, who was very disappointed that she could not be here this afternoon. And uh, I'm speaking on her behalf. When I'm asked to do this, I often feel like I'm taking care of someone else's baby. So I'm going to stick to the script for most part. So today, we will be listening to the inspiring work of Ms. Anaretta Kerala, a woman who has given a voice to many women 
who were unable to speak for themselves. In turn, each of these women has been given a voice to speak on behalf of other women in her community. And to echo Ms. Smith's uh, sentiment that this is a global problem, it certainly is, and it's one that we do have here in Canada, as you all know. Ms. Kerala and each of the women she has helped have shown us that to make change, we need to support one another and to work together. We know that from women all over the world who have shared their experiences of violence resulting from marginalization and oppression that this is the case. Hearing about the activism and resiliency of women like Ms. Kerala in the face of tremendous inequity and adversity gives us both motivation and tangible tools to make changes in our own communities. Through her organization, Métis Nepal, Ms. Kerala's work demonstrates how providing women with a combination of health and safety interventions, social support, and tools for economic empowerment is key to helping them escape violent circumstances and build lives of their own choosing. Here in Manitoba, the Child Sexual Exploitation and Human Trafficking Act was enacted in 2012 to provide greater rights and protections for victims of exploitation and trafficking. Through Tracia's Trust, Manitoba's sexual exploitation exploitation strategy, a system of community-based supports and resources has been developed to better help victims. Through partnership and collaboration, we are working together to address and ultimately prevent violence against women caused by sexual exploitation and human trafficking. As we leave here today, we will be inspired to continue this work for change in Manitoba and across the globe, recognizing the value of shared experiences in our struggles which connect us as a global community. So on behalf of the Manitoba government, I want to welcome Ms. Kerala to Winnipeg and commend her for her work to promote justice, health, and education for girls and women in Nepal. Her tireless advocacy is indeed an inspiration to each of us. And on behalf of the government of Manitoba, I also want to commend the Arthur V. Morrill Center for its important work in support of peace and justice by sharing your knowledge you help us to help others build strong communities where basic human rights and needs are recognized. And the importance of this work is truly valued. I would like to add on a personal note uh, that as a mother of a, a six and a four year old, I have learned how much uh, effort goes into creating human beings that grow up to be productive that are empathetic, that can uh, be kind to one another. And so to, to hear about uh, other women, and particularly children as well, that are not um, valued and treated in the way that I'm sure Ms. Corella has seen firsthand, is particularly soul-crushing. Uh, I've had this conversation with my mother thanking her much, much after the fact for all of the hard work that she put into my family. Uh, but I think that the job of uh, anyone, whether it's a parent or someone that's caring for a child, is to create human beings that don't tolerate that kind of, um, I don't know what you call it, activity, I suppose, someone that imposes their will on someone else. And I think when we clearly state uh, that that is not acceptable. We do two things. We tell the victim that they're not alone, and we also make it clear that we will not accept that, which uh, is the job for all the rest of us. And Ms. Kerala, thank you for your work. Thank you, Ms. Carruthers. It's now my pleasure to invite uh, Nepalese students from the University of Manitoba and the Nepali community to perform a tr traditional Nepali dance.
That was so beautiful. I would now like to invite representatives from the University of Manitoba's Nepalese Student Association and the Nepalese Cultural Society of Manitoba to welcome Ms. Anura Kerala by offering the traditional kata.
Thank you. Dr. John Weins, Professor and Dean Emeritus of the Faculty of Education and Chair of the Board of the Canadian Centre for Child Protection, will now bring greetings on behalf of the University of Manitoba and will introduce our speaker, Ms. Anura Korala. Thank you, Dr. Byrne. It's kind of sad that you have to listen to a, an old white man halfway through this thing. But anyway, we'll do the best we can. And thank you very much, Dr. Byrne, special guests, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all the people who have showed up today. But prior to introducing our guest speaker, I'd like to le read a message from our president, Dr. David Barnard, who regrets that he is unable to be here, but certainly wanted to know that on behalf of the university that we're very proud uh, uh, for this moment. It is my pleasure to bring greetings to the 10th Saul Caney Lecture on behalf of the University of Manitoba President and Vice Chancellor David Barnard, who sends his deep regrets. In addition to his service to our city, province, and country, Mr. Caney was a great citizen of this world. He was a respected and trusted business leader who also served as a director of the Bank of Canada and a confidant to prime ministers as far back as William Lyon Mackenzie King. Mr. Caney, who passed away in 2007, was a fixture on local charities such as the United Way, while also serving as chair of the World Jewish Congress and the Canadian Council of Christians and Jews. He was also a great friend of the University of Manitoba and was chair of our Board of Governors. It is fitting that we honor his local, national, and global legacy by bringing true champions of peace and social justice to Winnipeg and Manitoba on behalf of the Arthur B. Morrow Center for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College. This year, we are honored that Anurada Kerala is here with us. She has been recognized as a CNN hero for her work rescuing 12,000 women and girls from the sex trade and preventing tens of thousands more from entering into this world of abuse and slavery. Then it says, Dr. John Weens will be providing a more thorough introduction. <laughs> but I want to take this opportunity to express my deep respect for her vision, work, and courage. Today we will hear accounts of heartbreaking suffering, but also about success and hope as we have during past lectures. It is that hope and our belief that there are solutions to even the most seemingly intractable issues facing humanity that inspire us to vigorously pursue the important work of researching and promoting human rights. At the University of Manitoba, more than 150 researchers from a variety of disciplines focus on basic rights and freedoms to which all human beings are entitled. This work is conducted to the Arthur V. Morrow Center for Peace and Justice, Robson Hall, the Center for Human Rights Research Initiatives, as well as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Those of us dedicated to this research are witnesses to the very worst of humanity, but we also see people and communities at their very best. On behalf of President Barnard, thank you and congratulations to faculty, staff, alumni and friends who have worked hard to ensure the long-term success of this lecture long-term success of this lecture series. I also want to thank the Richardson Foundation for its support today to the Saul Caney Lecture and its enduring commitment to our university community. It is my sincere hopes that the words, hope that the words we hear today inspire us into action, bringing us closer to a world where we can live in peace and where we vigorously protect the safety and dignity of all our fellow global citizens. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. The Morrill Center could have done me no greater honor than to invite me to introduce our guest speaker, my little sister, Mrs. Anurata Kerala. I'll explain that. 
I thank Sean and Jessica for this honor. And on behalf of all of us, thanks for these opportunities to be part of something greater than any of us. I also want to thank one of our members of Parliament, Ms. Joy Smith, and the Canadian government for the tremendous work they have done in this area, preventing human trafficking, and both the Canadian government and Manitoba government, thank you, for taking the lead in the protection of children, an area that is more and more part of my own work and service as chair of the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. Today, we are reminded that the exploitation of children is a global problem. Every thinking and caring person's problem. And that the protection of children is the responsibility of every adult. In a global world, all children are our children. Gifts to a world where they represent the correcting and the healing power that can only come from a new generation with the help of older generations. We are truly blessed today to be living in a world where we can meet and join with people who remind us that each of us, one person joining with and working on behalf of others, can make the world a better place for thousands of others. We are especially blessed to be able to invite to and welcome into our community a very special person who exemplifies the very best of what humankind has to offer. Mrs. Anurata Kerala. Now I'm going to do something I often do as a teacher and anybody who's a teacher in the room does, I'm going to go offline. I'm going to ignore my script. You can read all the stuff in here. You can Google this. I'm assuming you've all read this and if you haven't Googled, you know, um, Mighty Nepal and uh, Anurata, I would encourage you to do so. You will not leave here today untouched and unmoved, because I just had lunch with this wonderful, remarkable lady. <laughs> She's got a killer sense of humor, too, by the way. So I want to speak to your hearts and souls, as well as your minds, knowing full well that I cannot do justice to her, her work. So now I have to go back to my other notes. See, I did have my lesson prepared. I just want you to know that. That's the most important thing. So today we are going to be asked to confront almost unfathomable human desperation and despair and evil and bear witness to and imagine equally incredible human imagination, goodness, and hope because of the miracles performed by the love of one human being. We're going to hear, fancy hearing this in a university, that helping others in need is not just another theoretical construct or some abstract philosophical framework, but rather how each of us, an example of how each of us can live a good life. We're going to be reminded that we live in a global world where every child is our child, and all women are our sisters, mothers, or neighbors. So folks, today, the Moral Center has brought us a gift. Please join me in welcoming, and I was going to say, Dijou Anurata, but she's my little sister, because we discovered that she's actually younger than I, and I just couldn't really call her a big sister. She's also a grandmother, and I'm a grandfather, right? So she's my little sister, which is, let me see if I get this right, Beni. Vini Angelata. <laughs> I welcome you to Winnipeg and the University of Manitoba to talk about Mighty Nepal's initiatives against human trafficking. Please join me in welcoming her and thank you very much for coming to our province. I'll just tell you another story then, on lunch. So I said to 
we were talking about our religions and our families and things like this. And so I said, well, yeah, you remind me of people, other people I know that, you know, are like you in terms of religion, something like this. You're gentle and kind. And stuff. She said, you think I'm gentle, you should come and live with me for a week. Uh, and you may hear some things that would suggest that she's sometimes less than gentle. She's small and carries a big stick. <laughs> to Mrs. Squirrel talking, we have a seven minutes video uh, for you. The snow-covered mountains of the Himalayas are the first sight to greet most travelers arriving in Nepal. Its capital, Kathmandu, is a busy hub for tourist traffic, climbers and trekkers drawn by the lure of Everest. Most who come use it as a gateway to adventure, but I'm here for a very different reason. Sandwiched between China and India, Nepal is also a magnet for another kind of human traffic. The tiny nation provides a steady supply of sex slaves for the brothels of Delhi and Mumbai. I arrived at Mighty Nepal to an overwhelming welcome. Nepalese people are known for their warmth and hospitality, and I was experiencing it firsthand. So wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Really, it's so it seemed like such a happy, cheerful group of young women and girls, but their stories would tell a different tale. It was hard to imagine that every single woman in this room had suffered at the hands of sex traffickers, pimps, or brothel owners. Recovery can take years, and emotional scars can be harder to detect than physical ones, and they definitely don't heal as easily. I wanted to come to learn what you're doing that's working so that I can find um, ways of, of helping share those best practices in my own country where this is also a problem. This is a big day though because news has come that another raid on the brothel has led to the rescue of her daughter. She is expected at Mighty Nepal any minute. Patali is both relieved but sick with concern for her safety. <laughs> Tragically, after such a long time apart, the terrified little girl does not recognize her mother and pushes her away, reaching out to her rescuer instead. As the mother of three girls myself, it was painful to watch and everyone in the room felt helpless. And, and how old is he now? Too often, it is children who are abused to ensure that their mothers comply with brothel owner's orders. The woman on my right is Radhika. By the time she was 12, she had been trafficked twice, had a kidney removed by illegal organ sellers, and had an 18-month-old son. And he is now in school, yes. The brothel keeper's cruelty was effective. When they were rescued and brought to mighty Nepal, the boy was unable to talk. Now eight years old, he's making progress, but is still nervous and wary of strangers. In just four hours at the border, I saw several thousand people crossing over. Anurada introduces me to Mighty Nepal's own border guards. Their slight appearance belies an intense determination which is born from their own experience. All of Mighty Nepal's guards were themselves trafficked into brothels. There are 50 guards working for Mighty Nepal across 10 checkpoints. Every day at the border, they will intercept on average 20 girls at risk of being trafficked. 
Mighty Nepal has a transit home near the border where rescued girls can begin to recover from their ordeal before being transferred to the main rehabilitation center in Kathmandu, and in some cases face their trafficker in court. Every time, you know, every week or every 15 days, you have to go to the court with the girl. So it takes one, and one, one to one and a half year for one case to be finalized. Wow. So during that period, we have to keep the girls with us. So we counsel the parents and say that the girls will stay with us. And during their stay with us, they do some trainings for their life skill, and mm -hmm. that is how we reintegrate them into the society. The average income in Nepal is a little over $200 a year. That's 57 cents a day. In the remote areas, it's often far less. Poverty is the means by which traffickers trap their prey, luring them away from their neighborhoods with the promise of work in the big city. It's to such a village that we're heading today. The answer for one trafficked girl, recently rescued from a brothel, lies in a remote mountain village six hours from Kathmandu. Tuli is one of the lucky ones, rescued and now home with her family. Anurada's crusade is to protect the thousands of other girls who will fall prey to the traffickers every year, and her work never ends. On our way back, we stop at another village. A critical part of Mighty Nepal's work is creating awareness about sex trafficking in the more remote regions of the country. Villagers are entertained with songs, dances, and speeches, all designed to educate them of the very real danger that's all around them. She is Gita, Hello, Gita. and uh, Gita has been with us for the last seven years, and uh, she was rescued from India, from Delhi, GB Road, with her son. She was trafficked with her son. And when Biran Gita's story is a familiar tale of trust and betrayal an orphan lured to India by the false hope of finding her parents, but instead finding herself in a life of hell. She says, what can a person with multiple disease like me do? Sometimes I think that, and then I'm just hopeless. But at times, again, I think, Mighty Nepal is there, they're teaching me craft. Then I think I can survive with this craft also. Thank you, can I have a hug? Long <laughs> I promise to do a really good job of sharing this so that we can, we can end this, so that, that, that it doesn't have to keep happening to other girls. But Anurada and Mighty Nepal can't save every child on their own. Anurada once said, just imagine if that was your daughter standing there. What would you do? How would you fight? Ladies and gentlemen, this video was made by CNN, uh, and this is a, a short version of Nepal's Stolen Children. After CNN has awarded CNN Hero Award 2010 to Mrs. Anuradha Koirala, they have launched massive program against human trafficking, and they have launched um, Freedom Project. So this film was under that Freedom Project. If you, I think, if you look onto CNN website, you'll be able to get full version. It's almost one hour long film. Thank you very much. Namaste. Uh, first, I would like to thank Moro Center for inviting me to the 10th annual Seoul Kani Lecture on Peace and Justice and giving me the opportunity to share my experience. And uh, I was just talking to uh, 
John and I was saying like, uh, what will I do in front of all the literate people here who are doctors and uh, PhDs and masters and uh, I'm nothing and I've just, I said, I will speak from my heart, I will do my best, I will try to tell you what actually we are doing back home to save the girls. Thank you. This is uh, one of the quotes which I like a lot. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. And I think it is all meant for all of us. Now, uh, Maithi Nepal's Action Against Human Trafficking, a Model of Peace Building Initiatives. On this, I would like to stress and say a little story. Uh, there was a girl who was just uh, 13 years old, and she was taken to India. Uh, when we rescued her, she was 13, but when she was taken, she was seven. And she was given Harman injections to make her big. And then she was exploited there. And as you know, uh, every day from five, they are exploited by five to 25 men, every day. Then she was again, take, she was in De Mumbai. And then from there, again, she was taken to Calcutta. And finally, we rescued her from uh, Madras, Chennai. So she was sold thrice. She was a baby because you cannot say a seven-year-old girl is a big, huge uh, girl. Though she, she looks, even if you look at her just now, she looks very young and uh, because of the injection, but uh, she is still a child in her behavior. Now, at the present moment, she is suffering with multiple disease. She has HIV, she has hepatitis, and one of her leg does not work properly, the right leg, because when you do not agree there what the brothel owners tell you, they burn you with electricity currents, they give you electricity currents, and on the back and on the hips, and uh, that is how she is not able to walk on her uh, right feet. So, but now, and she is mentally uh, still disturbed. She is disturbed, she is traumatized. She's been with us for nearly three years, but still she is traumatized. And uh, we even arrested her because Maithi Nepal, that is what we do. We have also arrested her trafficker and he's in jail. Uh, but uh, every time uh, she wants to study, but she cannot. She is a big girl now. She is already 13, she's been with us for the last uh, three, four years, and uh, she is 13. She is still in a nursery class, but she cannot go forward because uh, she is mentally disturbed. So this are the situation of the girls there. These kind of stories we have plenty. We also have, we need, we do not need passport to go to India, but to go to Bangladesh or to go to China, we need passports. So we have also, uh, a girl who was taken across the border uh, without any passport to Bangladesh and there she was sold and there from there uh, she she was beaten so badly that you know both her arms are not working so we have rescued her also there from there from Bangladesh we could not bring her back and uh, I went to the embassy Nepali embassy I told them please let me take her back to Nepal. And the ambassador was wonderful. He helped me, he made a paper, and I brought her by plane. When I came to the airport, the immigration at Bangladesh airport said, how can you, uh, uh, how, when did she come? Where is her passport? How can you take her back? And who brought her here? And then a lady was with me, a Bengali lady uh, from Bangladesh. 
she was a police officer and the person in the immigration was also uh, from the government and this lady was also from the government. So I, I didn't know what to say and he said, no, I cannot let her go because we have to show the entry of her coming into the country. So this lady said, a man like you brought her to Bangladesh. Now we are sending her back. So she has to go back. Even then he did not agree, then we called people from the embassy and finally with the government level talk, she was sent back to Nepal. So this is uh, the story of children. Our voice uh, is a society from trafficking of girls and women. We crusade against abuse, sexual exploitation, neglect, and violence and of children, girls, and women since 1993. We are affiliated to ECPACT. We are, uh, we've got a, we are Nepal chapter of ETSEC. ETSEC is a network on the regional side, on the SARC. Uh, from the uh, SARC region is seven countries. Bangladesh, Bhutan, Pakistan, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and what you said, and of, India and uh, now Afghanistan also. So now we are all, uh, this uh, this ETSEC is along that region, so we work together to repatriate and to rescue girls. Uh, the types of trafficking we have uh, is three types. Before we just had one, but now we've added two, domestic and uh, overseas, because uh, between the 10 years insurgency of the Maoist, Many people fled from the villages in uh, sur uh, search of safety into the big cities. And even they tried to cross the border to go to India for safety because of the fear of the Maoist. But they were trapped by the traffickers and internally, internally they have now started small cabin restaurants and dance restaurants and beauty parlors and massage parlors, which I've, at the beginning, when I heard about the cabin restaurant, I, I was quite happy also. I said, oh, now I can go there also because cabin I thought was a small restaurant where family could sit down and eat, but it was not like that. Small children were taken by the traffickers uh, in the name of service into the cabin restaurant, but their work was sexual exploitation. So all the children who came in search of uh, safety landed up in this cabin and dance restaurants. Now that is why we call it domestic trafficking. And to make it very sure to you, we do not have red light areas, but now we have this dance and cabin restaurant. But if you ask the dance and cabin restaurant owners, who, and if you go and ask the government, who gave the authority, Nobody knows, none of the government people also know who gave the authorities, because these are run by very strong politicians and policemen. So nobody can stop it. We are trying our best. We rescue girls from the dance and cabin restaurants also. And uh, we've got a group called Bishwas Nepal, which is all the girls who come from the cabin and dance restaurants and massage parlors and uh, they, res they have rescued so far 3,500 girls. And these are all dropout children from school. From, uh, they are either class three, four, eight. They are up to eight, nine. So now we are sending them to school and uh, we talk to them about safety in the uh, workplace, their wages and all that. And then next, cross-border trafficking. This is happening since 1834 between India and Nepal. So this is, uh, uh, our girls are taken into India. Then overseas trafficking. Now it is just started a few years back, that is about, uh, uh, it's been rampant since six, seven years, but it has been there since 10 years that our children are taken into Gulf countries. A child of 13 years is issued a passport of 25 years, whereas in our country, our law says you are adult only when you are 16, and you are supposed to get your citizenship when you are 16. Then after 16, you can get the passport, after you get the citizenship. But here, children of 13 are given passport of 25 years old, and this is a racket there. It's called setting, 
the whole setting system is there and they give the children passports and send them to Gulf countries and they are not allowed to go via Nepal's uh, airport, they go via Indian airport. Uh, this is the changing dimension. Since uh, 19, uh, 1835 to 1990, slavery and sexual exploitation was there. Uh, we had the Rana system, and uh, during that time, girls were taken in as uh, uh, domestic servants, but they were like slaves. So th that existed for up to 1990. And then from 1950 to 1990 AD, cross-border as well as trafficking of children for circus work. Many of our children, everybody knows in that particular area, in particular that district, Makwanpur district, and particular caste Tamangs, all of them send their children to circus, knowing that they were going for circus and they are paid quite well also, Indian circus. But when they land up there, after they start their menstruation, they are not sent back home. They are sold to the brothels. So they are exploited twice. Once for circus as child labor, and then secondly, they are sold into the brothels. Then uh, 1990 to 2000, uh, 2006, cross-border, as well as domestic trafficking in massage parlors, cabin restaurants, and dance bars. Then cross-border and overseas trafficking in costs of foreign employment, trafficking for labor, exploitation, and organ trading. Organ trading is very, very common now. Uh, again, in one district that is called Kavre, uh, that district, everybody, everybody sells their organ. They know it. But sometimes our girls are unknowingly taken, married in false... Uh, the false marriage, and then they are taken into India, and then their organ is sold, and they come back with little money, and then after a few months, again they are sold to the traffickers back in India. Uh, these are, this is what a brothel looks like, and this is how the girls have to dress up. In, this is in Mumbai, and uh, the internal trafficking is not only Pokhara, Bhairava, it's all over the major cities in Nepal now. And uh, the cross-border trafficking is Mumbai, Pune, Surat, Delhi, Kolkata, Siliguri, Gorakhpur, Merat, and Nagpur. But it is now also happening in Ludhiana and Chandigarh also. It, uh, it has started. And in the eastern part of uh, India, that is Silchar, Assam, the, it has also started there. And the new destination is Middle East and China and Africa. China, our girls are taken again there as uh, workers, but then they're sexually exploited because China claims that we do not have red light areas, but they have plenty of red light areas and they exploit girls. Then Africa, girls are taken from the dance and cabin bars. They are taken in, uh, in the name of dancers into Africa, especially Tanzania, Kenya, Ghana, Nairobi, these countries, and again there, they are taken as uh, workers, dancers, but then they are sexually exploited there. This is what, uh, how many transit homes and prevention homes, uh, the homes we have all over Nepal. Three prevention homes we have, 10 transit homes, two hospices, one child protection center, two women rehabilitation centers, interception points, and one community outreach office. This is in the 29 districts we work. Uh, the most important and the major activity which we do is the awareness in the villages. Every year we do eight. If we had financial support, we would have done more than that, but eight is a compulsory, we do it every year. And the drama group which you see here are girls, this is the most popular one. These girls are girls who are trafficked themselves. The first day when I saw their drama, they showed me and said, this is what we are going to do in the villages from now onwards. I had goosebumps and I cried for hours and at night I could not sleep. It was so real, so real that uh, it was really very hard, you know, breaking for me.
and then we go from door to door. We do not go alone. We take police, we take lawyers, we take students, we take nurses, doctors, because we want to give the message in the village uh, about trafficking, not only trafficking, but what are its consequences? What happens after it? How you can report to the police? How, what is the legal status? Then what is the disease you bring back and how you tackle with it? So that is why we take all these people and we go and we take the journalists with us. Because all the journalists sitting in the capital, they write whatever they feel like, but they have not seen the villages. They have not gone there. So we take the journalists and to see what the village looks like and what the actual problem is. So we give leaflets. We have a, a class called Student Against Girl Trafficking in uh, all of the country. From class five onwards to eight, we sensitize the students every, uh, in three months, we go and take class to the students. And uh, every month, they have competitions. We go and talk about trafficking. And then they have competition on essay writing on trafficking, uh, a drawing competition. And uh, uh, they have drawing competition, poem writing competition. And then we reward them. The best student who writes about trafficking, we reward them. Or the drawing, which is the best, we reward them. So this has also become a very popular uh, program for us. Then we, ha we advocate every time we go on the street uh, with different sponsors for us, uh, advocating for the change of the policies. This year, uh, we made the biggest human chain along Kathmandu, we, around the whole Kathmandu Ring Road, there was about 7,000 people who joined hands around the capital. We, uh, you, like we made a big ring, human chain, and we stood there for half an hour. And uh, along then, it was not only in Kathmandu, it was also in, uh, 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 between the Nepal and India border. So we were, we were making human chain this year for the anti-trafficking day. And uh, this is uh, advocacy for policy reforms, but uh, this is uh, the first national conference on uh, migrant workers. Because this is, uh, they take them as migrant workers, as I told you, to the Middle East, but then they are not uh, used as workers. In this big hall, uh, in India, there would be thousands of girls, but half of this room would be given to the girl who is in uh, Middle East. She would be given a, the half of this room for herself with all the facilities, but the work would be the same as in India. So her expectation is uh, ruined, and she comes back shattered. And every Friday, we stand on a bridge which through which all the policymakers go and all the UN people and the international organization go. And every week we have different issues and we stand on the, there with banners. And uh, this is for police. We also sensitize police. And now it, in the curriculum of the police department, not only police, it's the government. In their curriculum, they have to take one class for, uh, against trafficking, and they have to come to Maithi Nepal, and the class is taken by our girls, the traffic survivors. So this is also one of the biggest achievement we have got. And these are the prevention homes. In the prevention homes, we give them different skills. These girls are girls whose sisters and aunts have been trafficked, but they are vulnerable. So we, t we have as you, I told you, we have three prevention homes. Each prevention home, we have 30 girls for six months. And for in a year, we train 180 girls from three prevention homes. And after the training of six months, we give them microcredit loans, and we start their business in the village. We do not want them to come into the cities in search of job and get trapped and be trafficked. So we intercept them in the village itself. And this is what the border of India and Nepal looks like. It's just a bamboo. The other side is India, this side is Nepal. 
uh, uh, the other side is India and this is uh, Nepal. So at the border, our girls are standing. You have seen in the movie also, here also, our girls go and see every vehicle, every person they stop. And every time they stop, they intercept daily four to five girls. And sometimes they are able to even arrest traffickers. And this is uh, rescue. This is what the brothel looks like. And it is very, very difficult to do rescue in India. Uh, it, you, uh, a few years back, it was very difficult in Mumbai. But now it has become easy in Mumbai and Pune, a little difficult in Delhi and Merat. But uh, it's becoming easier than before. Because uh, all the time we think of a person who is in the high post, we like to send him for uh, a meeting, a conference. We support that person. We never think of the people who are working in the ground and who does their daily work for 24 hours. So what we thought was, when you rescue a child, you need about uh, five days to reach the border and to uh, bring the rescued one rescued girl, five to six policemen have to come. Because in, the, in between, Maybe the trafficker will attack, so that is why many police come. So to stop this hassle, what we thought was, OK, there is a direct flight from uh, uh, Mumbai to Kathmandu. So we said, we will bring you by plane. So now only two policemen came, along with one lady constable. So three of them came, as for them, uh, Kathmandu is the holiest place. So they went around the temple, and when they returned back, uh, and uh, we gave them some gifts, and they went back. So what I'm trying to tell you is it's not that we are bribing them, but we rewarded them by giving them easy ride, easy tra uh, uh, travel. And now it is they, before they were bribed by the brothel owners, and they would not, we would not be able to rescue a single minor girl. But now, when there is a minor girl, they inform us from the police station and say, they are minor girls in this brothel. Please come and raid. So just a pat on her back on a ride, a holy ride in Kathmandu made this big change. This is the physical tortures they come with. <coughs> burnt, all burnt. Uh, this is acid throw. And this was study, research was done by Harvard University in 2006 and 7. And uh, out of that, they found out, out, uh, out of, they did research on 287 girls. And out of that, they found out that 38% were found to be infected. Age at the time of trafficking was 7 to 32 years. 14.7% uh, 14 were 14 years or younger. 33.8 were aged 15 to 17 years. 44.4 were 18 years or older. Destination of trafficking were uh, more was Mumbai, 58.2. Next largest was Pune, 45, that is 20. And followed by Delhi, 28. And Kolkata, 5. And uh, 1.8 were trafficked for, uh, to multiple cities. So this is the research done by the Harvard University. And this is the medical condition of workers in Gulf countries. 57% of the girls, they come with psych uh, psychotic uh, problems. And 2% uh, pregnant. Uh, then PTV, 4%. And others, 4%. Uh, uh, this is the survivors we have rescued from vulnerability. In 2007, it was 2,790. In 2008, it was 2,673. In 2009, it was 2,518. Uh, in 2010, it was 3,360. And 11, 3,500. And 12, 4,060. Uh, and uh, in our office, we have uh, three lawyers daily working. On Sundays and Fridays, it's fully packed because uh, now people after the awareness, people do not go to report uh, 
do not go to report to the police. They rather come to us with all the problems, missing problem, domestic problem, any problem, the woman come to us, the parents come to us. So we have three lawyers with us. So every day they have issues of um, polygamy, sinship, divorce, and uh, in 2008, uh, there was nine, 916 cases of uh, domestic violence and 44 of cases of rape. In 2011, it was 834 cases of domestic violence and uh, 25 cases of rape. In 2010, it was 656 cases of domestic violence, 17 cases of rape, uh, 710 cases of domestic violence and cases of 17 cases of rape. So every day we deal with this, and we only not take the cases. We fight for the cases. We fight for the cases till the end, until it is over. So the conviction rate of the traffickers so far. In 2007, it was three, uh, 32. In 2008, it was 42. In 2009, it was 35. In 2010, 31. In 2011, 25. And in 2012, 35. So far, we have convicted so many people. And uh, this is the consequence. This is our hospice. This, uh, when you look at her, I think you find that she is 47 or 8, uh, 57, 60. But she was only 17. And she died of H HIV and MDR, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. And this is our hospice on the eastern part of Nepal, uh, in uh, Jhapa district. And this is our hospice in Kathmandu. These are the children of the uh, survivors who are positive and who are going under medication. Rehabilitation and reintegration efforts. Uh, we provide safe shelter and safe uh, shelter means when a girl comes, we have a home, we have a rehabilitation center where we keep the girls until and unless the cases are over in the court. And uh, if they, we don't, and many, many times we do not find their parents, so we have to keep them with us and give them different trainings and reintegrate them in the society. And we provide medical treatment. We have doctors and seven nurses and we have a small clinic of our own, and we provide vocational trainings. We have a workshop where girls are trained by uh, three teachers. And uh, we also, as I told you, we help in filing cases of traffickers. We have uh, lawyers with us. We call parents to Maithi Nepal, and because as soon as a girl comes, the parents want to take the girl back home. But we do not allow them to go back because if the girl goes back home, she may be again bribed by the parents and the case may be hostile and we may lose and the, uh, the trafficker may come out. So we keep the girl with us for one to one and a half years uh, until the cases are over in the court and we counsel the parents in that way so that later on he doesn't complain to us. Then uh, we, call, uh, we conduct follow-up uh, visits to uh, know the situation of the reintegrated girls. Every time when we send a girl, it is not that we just leave them, now they are reintegrated, they are empowered, or they know they are earning something. We just don't leave them like that. We go and visit. We have social visits by our officers. This is the dormitory. This is what it looks like in Maithi Nepal. Uh, this is our clinic. This is our workshop, and this uh, girls are also trained in uh, beauty parlors, bakery, uh, uh, housekeeping, service, carpentry, bakery, computer for a uh, little bit literate who has gone through uh, non-formal education and electricity and wiring. And this is the reintegration part. You have seen in the movie also how parents cry when they meet their children. Uh, this is Maithi Nepal. 
We have formal education for the children. This is now Dasera is coming, a big festival. This is what is going to be put up in the, uh, uh, our center. Uh, this is only put up for 10 days in the center. And after that, we take this out. This is a swing, a very traditional swing for that very occasion. Now, my thing uh, uh, in, in, uh, initiation for, uh, for and with conflict affected children. We have a center where there are 100 and, uh, 126 girls, and uh, you have written 100 here, I think. 126. It is called Bal Basera. Bal Basera means uh, home for children. There were plenty of uh, children who were affected by conflict, but we were able to take only 100 children, and now we have 126 be uh, because we didn't have space. So now these children are very difficult uh, because they have gone through the trauma. They have seen their parents being killed. They have seen all the uh, conflict through, uh, throughout their childhood. So now they are with us. We counsel them and we send them to formal education. Uh, this is a child protection center. We have a child protection center. Child Protection Center and Bal Basera are two different units. In Child Protection Center, we have children who are raped, who are children of domestic violence, uh, child labor and trafficking survivors and orphans, and they all go to school. And, and we have a halfway home for children. These children are from internal trafficking and minors who, have, uh, who enter halfway home undergo income generation training to become economically independent. Children ultimately get reunited with their families after getting empowered economically, socially, legally, and psychologically. We do not leave the children just like that. We just don't hand over the children to the parents like that. We make sure that they are economically independent or they are educated. So only then we hand over because we feel that if you do not educate them or we do not empower them, they may, re they may be re-trafficked again. This is what the school looks like. We also have boys. As, a, as, a, as we have a home for children, when an unwanted child is on the street, a baby is on the street, the police or the local people just bring it to us, or the government sends it, them to us. We cannot deny when it's a boy. So we take in the boys. Now we have 36 boys. They are very, very good boys and very nice boys, not like other children. They are very different. <laughs> not like girls. Girls are a little problematic, but boys are very, very good. Uh, uh, awareness, interception, and rescue. We have rescued 22,000 girls, women from exploitation and conditions leading to exploitation reach to about 30% of the total population through awareness raising and radio television programs. Every day, four to five girls are intercepted from each of the 10 transit homes. And this radio program and television programs are very, very powerful because television, maybe even in a uh, city, uh, if you survey, some people may not have television. But radio is so cheap. We have these Chinese radios. Everybody carries it. So, it's a very good media. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of awareness uh, through uh, radio. So recently, we had two little girls who were rescued from China. They were taken there when they were seven years old. They had forgotten the language. They both had gotten forgotten Nepali language. And they knew only Chinese. And we didn't know Chinese. So we had to do hand sign. So, and we asked them where their house was. So they remembered their districts. One said Chitwan, the other one said uh, Sindhupanchok. So that was enough for us. So we took them, uh, after 15 days of teaching them how to speak and all, we took them and told the radio people to ask simple questions. And our counselor went with them. And after doing the radio program, uh, the, there was a lady next day in the office, and she said, yesterday we heard a radio program. My sister was missing since seven years. Maybe this is the girl. Can I see her? 
So I went and then I said, uh, why did you bring her from the village? And she said, she came to look after my child. So I went to uh, the girl outside and I said, did you come to Kathmandu to look for after your sister's baby? And she said, no. I said, come in. And then I uh, confronted them. Both of them didn't recognize each other. And she said, this is not my sister. And she said, this is not my sister. What I'm trying to tell you is, at least the radio program made that lady to look for her lost sister. So radio programs are really very strong. Peace building efforts of Maithi Nepal in a nutshell. Prevention of trafficking through mass awareness program in high risk areas. Ensuring livelihood opportunities through various income generation and vocational trainings. Providing formal education to children vulnerable to trafficking and other forms of violence. Providing legal services to facilitate justice delivery with an intention to ensure rule of law, gender equity, and quality in a police society. Rescuing and rehabilitating trafficked girls, women, provide legal remedies, shelter, support them for economic sustainability, and reintegrate them in the societies. Promote harmony and coherence in the society by reducing stigma and discrimination against the survivors with regards to their health, physical, and psychological conditions. Initiating dialogue with stakeholders from all sectors, public, private, corporate, social, to address the changing, changing model uh, modes and manifestation of human trafficking. Coordinating with media and using social network sites to uh, disseminate timely, appropriate messages, which in turn would harmonize people from all walks of life towards human trafficking issues. For here, like uh, sometimes like this uh, disseminating timely, appropriate message to harmonize people, sometimes this makes a little difficult for us because it's not being used properly. So, pro uh, <laughs> providing service to conflict affected children, I have already explained to you. Thank you. And no more of these. Thank you so much. Finally, I would like to request all the pre uh, people present here to uh, vote for Mrs. Anuradha Koirala, who is again nominated for another uh, Human Dignity Award. Uh, and uh, here's the link. And that, your votes count. And as they have a huge amount uh, award prize, which helps us to rescue and reintegrate many, many Nepali girls back home. Thank you so much. If there is any questions, I'm ready to take. <laughs> Your job is done. Your job is done. I had cliff notes for ground rules for questions, but uh, I found out that uh, Miss Corolla was educated by Irish Loretta's sister, so I think she can take care of herself. <laughs> If you have a question, please go to the microphone. One short question. Name, please. <laughs> Namaste. I'm Smita Rasmandari. I'll ask you a question in Nepali. I'm from Nepal. I was born in Nepal. You're Nepali? Yes, I am. I'm a proud Nepali. Thank you. Welcome to Winnipeg. First, I'll, I'd like to ask her in uh, Nepali, then I'll translate it for the audience in English. So my question is, Tapai jaba suru gano bhai ya kaam 20 bar sa gaadi. Ekle hunun thiyo, dheere manse thena, saathe haru dheere thena. Tapai ko aafno, aafoi sangha ko sangha sa, ko baare ma ke bandhi nus na? Okay, actually she is uh, Sunita Raj Bandari. Smrita. Junita. Smrita. Smrita. Sumrita, okay. 
if I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> she is asking me uh, to, t uh, she knows, as a Nepali, she knows how I started 20 years ago alone, and she wants to te uh, tell all of you my struggle during those days. Yes, That's absolutely. the question, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Nepali ma wano ki English ma wano? Nepali. I think, whatever, your, your choice. Nepali, no, I don't think so, it's fair. <laughs> okay. When I started, I was just a teacher, a school teacher, primary school teacher, and later on I became a high school teacher. And the political situation during my time was very, very different. Uh, we were, there was trafficking, as you saw, it was since 1835, but uh, nobody spoke about it. But as soon as uh, 1990, when we got the democracy, everybody started speaking about it. And then uh, I myself, I myself thought, people are speaking of so many rights. There are parliamentarian, respected parliamentarians here. Uh, there are people from dis different walks of life. Everybody speaks of rights, rights, human right, woman right, child right, every right. But I did not see all the rights being placed in the right place. <laughs> right? Because I saw children and women begging on the street with the children on the back. And then I asked them, why are you on the street? Then there was the answer. She was a victim of domestic violence. Where was her right? People were speaking in a five-star hotel. Where was her right? Who was fighting for her? Then there were girls and women who had children, who were survivors of polygamy. Husband had taken another wife and she was on the street. Or the husband was dead and the mother-in-laws had sent them on the street. So where were all their rights? So this was a little disturbing. And for myself also, I, I am by, I'm, I'm from an ethnic caste, but my husband is from a, uh, we have caste system still in Nepal, he is from a high caste. So my marriage was a love marriage. But my father always said, today you have betrayed me because you have, uh, you have, I always took you as my son, today you have betrayed me. I cannot forget that. Because when I went into this family, there was always violence. From verbal violence from my in-laws, that I was a low caste, this, that. So I could not go to the court, or I could not go to the police station, because that would be a stigma to my family. So this was also one of the reasons. And then, then I saw uh, people talking about trafficking. And one girl, my house was next to a small office of which had just, uh, they have just started to work against trafficking. And they didn't know where to put this traffic survivor who was the first HIV person in Nepal. They didn't know where to put her because they didn't have a place. And definitely she was HIV and people were scared about to keep her in a shelter. So they asked me, on, because uh, I am, I, uh, many people know, I think, uh, in Nepali people, that I'm little, very open and little friendly, and I'm little uh, nasty also. So I said, okay, <laughs> okay. I said, okay, I will take the child and I'll keep her with me. She was big. She was about 22 years old. And uh, Gita, her name was Gita Danwar, and she came, and I had a place, I had my son. So I put her in my room, in one bed, and I was in the other bed. The whole night, even like I was sleepy, she used to say, Didi, please get up. And she used to go on telling me her stories. The horrifying stories made me so upset that I thought I should now raise my voice and start working for it. Then I said, first what I did was, I went to the street with the street woman, and I said, why don't you work? They said, who will give me work? Okay, all of you all are doctors here. But tomorrow when you go to look for a job, they will ask for a reference. You have to get a reference, right? You will not get the job immediately. So in the same way, this girl said, who will give us a job? They may think we will steal and run away. 
they will not give us a job. So I said, okay, I will give you jobs. Will you work? They all said, yes, we will work. So I didn't have money. I was not that rich person. So I used to get 7,000 rupees. So I said I would manage. So I, I had some savings. So I took eight women and I started small shops on the streets, which is called Nanglo Pasal. Nanglo Pasal means a uh, uh, round thing which we husk the rice uh, and uh, small sweets, tobacco, matches, uh, chewing gums, and all these things I kept for them. And they started. But I said, you have to return to me two rupees per day. Because if you do not return two rupees, I cannot uh, start another one for another person. This I said, I could not do it with 16 rupees per day. I could not do another, another shop. But Nepalis are so nice. I, I don't know. They are, they are very different. Not nice, but I think nice also different also. Because uh, today they have 100 rupees. They use the whole 100 rupees and enjoy themselves. They don't think about tomorrow. So that is why I thought they should learn the habit of saving. So I started with this woman. Now this woman told me, after the one week they said, we have our girls. And Pashupati Nath is a temple, holiest temple for all of the Hindus all over the world. And in that temple, all the bad things happen. Marijuana, drugs, everything is sold there. So, and people use it. So that is why the children were sexually exploited by these men who used to take drugs. So they wanted the children to be safe. They said, you talk about trafficking, maybe our daughters will be trafficked, please keep her with us. So I said, I have one son, I will take these 10 children and I'll start. But then I started, I thought it, I would manage it, but it was very, very difficult. Then I had to borrow money from here, I had to borrow money from here, and uh, then I realized what our friends, what our families, everybody, because when you ask for money, the harsh words they have told me when I was not able to return is still in my heart. So it was very, very difficult when I started. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to, to speak to us in Winnipeg today. We've learned a lot about uh, your efforts and what you're doing, and I th I'm from uh, Mesh International. My name is Stella Lejean, and I'm uh, past president of Mesh International, and we have some, some work that we, that we do in, in, in Nepal. Now, you may run across some people that uh, we've worked with before. But we're looking for, uh, for a, well, now I'm going to be promoting that we look for a way to, show, to join forces to try and, and uh, uh, find the people who've been trafficked because we work internationally. We have centers in Africa, Latin America, Caribbeans, you know, India, and so forth. So hopefully we can join our forces to bring back, to take back home the children who've been uh, you know, traffic to other countries. And I think with your system and the policing system that you have, we can learn lessons from that and be able to rescue the children who've been, who've been trafficked to other countries. If they're in, a, in an area where our partners are aware of, of the children and where, they, where they've been, where they've been uh, uh, trafficked from, we can be in touch with, your, with Maiti and make sure that those children can be sent back to their homes. So I, I, I would like to suggest that as a way we could work together. Thank you so much. We would also like to coordinate and work with you, but we would like to have your address before we start to work. Yes. <laughs> I'm giving you a, a, a brochure that will show you. will see from the brochure that you know we, work, we do a lot of work. We're not rich like you. Or we're just average women. No, but no, we, all of but us we are working together. <laughs> We all are working together. <laughs> but we find ways, and nothing stops these women, you know, from, from doing what we can. And Canadian people are very generous. 
because since we are, we are here in Canada now, we get a lot of, of funding uh, from our partners. We call them partners that we work with, you know, to try and do, uh, bring good to the world. Most of the, of, the, of the people we work with are really destitute women in, uh, in, 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 in places where they've been affected by war. And, uh, and they are constantly on the run. So they come across other people who come, who, who've been brought from other countries, you know, to be trafficked, trafficked in, the, in, these, in these centers. So we're gonna be keeping an eye out and joining forces. And thank, thank you, you very, very much, much thank again. You, thank you so much, thank oh, you so thank much. You. <laughs>
along with the courage for them to start anew, but you have paved a path for students like myself who look up on you and dream to continue your legacy in the days to come. And as a symbol of appreciation for coming all the way to Winnipeg and sharing your experiences with us, on behalf of Mara Center, I'd like to present Anuradha Ma'am with an uh, inakshuk, which is a cultural symbol of, made up of stone, traditionally meant for communication and survival among um, Aboriginal community in North America, and also a book which uh, describes the proud history of Manitoba. Once again, a very big thank you to Anuradha Ma'am for sharing your wisdom with us. We are deeply inspired by your great words, and indeed, you are our hero. Thank you. I thank all of those who helped to prepare today's event, especially Tali, Sitzker, Annette Jones, Al Alede Venense, Estudela, Upendra Pradham, Rinshu Dupka, Casey Rakshaya, and Susan Ducharme. Uh, just to uh, give a plug for some upcoming Moro Center events, and you can always check our website at umanitoba.ca slash moro underscore center. Dr. Lewis Kreisberg, uh, founding director of the program for the analysis and resolution of conflict at the Maxwell School for Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University, will deliver a lecture on ideas and applications of constructive conflict resolution on March 17th, uh, 2014. And the 9th Winnipeg International Storytelling Festival will be held May 14th through 17th, 2014. Um, I would ask everybody to remain seated until our honoured guests and our honourable members of the uh, uh, party have departed the Manitoba room. I want to thank you all for coming to this memorial event and please have a safe trip back home. Thank you very much. Thank you.